OpenStack has a lot of history in uh, Texas, as does tequila and handguns, um, which seems to sort of tie this, uh, this whole story together because this talk is going to be mostly about mistakes. Um, and tequila and handguns and OpenStack are all in that, that general theme. Uh, humans don't make good decisions. We hopefully oscillate towards something that doesn't suck by a series of mistakes. And if we're doing really, really well, there are smaller and smaller mistakes. Uh, the nice thing about technology is that it improves the rate at which we can make mistakes and therefore hopefully get to a good solution. Um, but technology by itself doesn't make us make fewer mistakes. It just makes us uh, make them faster. So as I mentioned, uh, cocktails are coming up. And uh, I actually, it would be better if you had a cocktail right now. It would make this talk more interesting. So just imagine you're drinking as I'm speaking, and, uh, and we'll take it from there. All right, everyone lies. Uh, open source developers lie about as much as everyone else. Um, open source as a community is full of lies. And the biggest lie, uh, the lie is, of course, uh, in everyone's job right now, is that open source is not about money. How many of you have a job? OK. How many of you work on open source? Aha. The lie is debunked. Um, geeks are horrible liars. You guys were all supposed to lie right there to preserve the myth. So uh, the nice thing about open source compared to any other community is that it's a great environment to do social experiments in because every social experiment is plagued with lying, but uh, you guys are really bad at it, which makes it easy to figure things out. All right, so actually kicking this talk off, I want to talk about scaling out community, um, which is something we did as a mistake uh, in OpenStack. And I have some funny insights about what happened uh, and, and happened to go well. Um, how many of you have heard of Conway's Law? OK, good. You're going to learn something. Oh, one person. All right, well, you should leave now, because you already know what we're talking about. Um, Melville Conway uh, had this great insight, which is that when you write software, uh, it looks like the organization that wrote it. So if you have an organization with four teams, they will write you a four-pass compiler. Um, OpenStack has a lot of separate components, uh, and I think we can learn some things about the community based on the number of components involved. Um, this is a cautionary tale. I'm not a, I'm not a downer, right? I'm not going to give a talk about how I hate all the things, although I do wish I was Cal Henderson some days. Um, but I did work at NASA. Does anyone recognize this photo? OK, this is the only photo that we got from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter before it smashed into Mars at a ridiculously high velocity. And that is the result of a Conway's Law effect. MRO was built by a couple of different teams, one of whom was using metric, one of whom was using imperial. So when Conway's Law goes wrong, uh, it goes wrong at high velocity into the surface of the moon, or of Mars, sorry. Um, we also did crash into the moon. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but the insight here is, is that you have really three components to any open source project. You have the code itself, you have the community or the people, and you have the culture. And we've already identified Conway's law as the fact that the code is going to look like your community. Uh, it, it follows sort of logically that your community looks like the culture. And I'll get into that in a little bit. And so the lucky thing about OpenStack uh, by accident is that we had the right culture when we started uh, to scale. So we ended up with kind of scale out culture instead of scale up culture. Uh, and, and maybe that's worth learning something from. So OpenStack. How many of you know what OpenStack is? Just sort of show of hands. OK. This talk has gotten so much easier over the years. When I started talking about OpenStack, it wasn't even called OpenStack, uh, which we're going to get to. So OpenStack uh, in the Cliff Notes is about 10,000 people. Uh, it's about one and a quarter million lines of code. It's less than three years old. It is the fastest growing open source project in history by most interesting metrics, number of deployments, number of servers, number of people, number of lines of code written, how fast, et cetera. Um, it is a great example of scale. Uh, and a lot of things went bad. Um, but the history of that, roughly speaking, the official history is that in the beginning there was NASA and Rackspace. 
the fact really on the NASA side, and I can't really speak on the Rackspace side, I wasn't there, but on the NASA side, before there was NASA, there were six of us from a small company called Anso Labs in a bar um, and a project that nobody has ever heard this name before, so I figured France was a good place to, uh, to bring up the original name of OpenStack, which was Panay. <laughs> a uh, horrible name. I don't even know what that means in French, if it means anything at all. Um, Andy Smith came up with it. It was supposed to be short for Python networking or PyNet, which we weren't even write, writing networking, so that doesn't make any sense. So OpenStack. Uh, I was working at NASA. NASA launches rockets. The best part about having worked at NASA is you get to legitimately use photos of rockets in your presentations, which makes everyone's presentation look cooler. Uh, keep that as a tip for you. Um, NASA uses those rockets and satellites to uh, take photos of the sun, take photos of the Earth. This was that giant oil spill we had. Um, you know, send people into space where they live and uh, take photos of giant cyclones and stuff. And all of those photos and videos and sensor readings turn into big data. I hate the term big data. No disrespect to Doug Cutting, who's just on stage. Um, big data, by most people's definition, is really small. NASA's big data problem is particularly acute because we have things like MRO, where we built an entire data center for the data that we were going to get from that mission that then didn't happen. And then we have things like LCROSS, where we deliberately smashed a spacecraft into the moon to look for water, um, and we produced an enormous amount of data in about 10 seconds. Um, and by enormous, I mean our smallest data set when we started this thing that turned into OpenStack was 100 terabytes, and we did originally look at using AWS. The biggest EBS volume we could get at the time was one terabyte. Um, we figured that it was gonna take us more than a year to get enough data into Amazon to do a test calculation, um, so we didn't. Uh, we built something instead. Uh, they, they came up with this sort of sneaker net feature a little afterwards where you could mail them drives, um, which works out pretty well. And in this process, uh, I want to get to culture, but I'm going to start with one of the most important cultural aspects. Um, OpenStack was never a standards effort, um, and I am not very good at bureaucracy. I hate following rules, and I, I don't think anyone else should have to either. So originally, uh, we were trying to release open source as NASA. And I spent two years trying to get through the NASA legal process that would allow us to release open source. Um, and this was sort of the experience of that release process. Um, and then eventually, uh, I just said, fuck it, and I put it on my blog. Um, if OpenStack had not been enormously successful, I would be in a lot of trouble. So most of those two years, I spent most of my time in meetings with lawyers. We actually wrote all of Panay, which became Nova just shortly before it launched, in 17 days, right before this blog post. So that's going to come to the second part of, of culture that I think is important. If you don't ship, what the hell is the point? So there's a lot of folks, and I'm not picking on anybody in particular. There's a bunch of folks who got on stage today to talk about things that will be open source in the future. My least favorite conference talk ever, because you just got me really excited about something I can't use. So now I'm going to go find something that's really crappy, but is open source, and work on that instead. Um, so culture, there were two magical things that happened in that original OpenStack release, totally by accident. Um, one was that we shipped. Bob Parsley worked at uh, AOL, of all places, AOL slash Netscape, when I was working on the Netscape browser. And he had this sign on his office door. And I thought that was awesome, because he was the final go, no-go decision guy, who was like, OK, is the browser going out today or not? We always shipped. We patched Netscape 8.0 24 hours after we released it which is not quite continuous deployment, but it was sort of the, the early predecessor to that. <laughs> OK, ship all the things, always ship, but ship everything. So that's the second piece we're going to get to. The other lucky accident in culture at, at, uh, at NASA, that team, the Ansel Labs team, we were already peers. We'd been coding together on open source at that point for, I don't know, four or five years. Um, 
And so I get called the technical lead or the chief architect or whatever. If you ask any member of that team, they didn't do what I said. Nobody ever does what I say in OpenStack. They never have. Um, in fact, nobody does what anybody says. So it's very much kind of a Gen Y community. It's just people doing whatever they want. You're all your own leader, um, which scales really well, but it has other problems. OK, the lesson under here that I'm trying to drive at is that you can't change culture. The culture of your project is baked in the first time you start laying code down to Emacs or, or BI or whatever. Um, anything you're going to do, you should start out doing early on. And uh, we had this culture of rough consensus and working code. We had a culture of, of drinking and unit tests and code review. And we had this culture of, of kind of a, we were a community of peers. Um, how many of you have ever been involved in building a house? Anyone? OK, one or two people. Uh, there's a thing about houses. If you're a, what's called an owner builder, which I was when I was very young a number of times, Owner builders forget two really important things. They forget closets, and they forget staircases. My father built a three-story house with no staircases. <laughs> it's really hard to add a staircase after the fact. Um, staircases are kind of like those early cultural building blocks. You need them in the building. Uh, the bolting them on, it looks silly. OK. so. Culture is important. You've got to bake it early on. These are some of the, and uh, you know, don't try and click on these right now because you have no Wi-Fi, but later on, uh, the first release of Panay had unit tests that covered 85% of the code base. It had a full set of Sphinx-generated docs that were hosted on GitHub pages. It had a style guide called hacking.txt that explained the style guide and the PEP8 rules and how we interpreted them that still exactly the style guide used in OpenStack today. Um, and that was in the first two days, 48 hours, I think. Um, if, if you care about these best practices, test-driven development and code review and working as a team, start that way. Don't wait until you're like, oh, well, in a few months, we're going to release this open source, and then we'll really get our act together. That never happens. Either you never release the code, or you never get better at how you're coding. There's always too much to do. Uh, just as one last example, this is before we released Panay. Um, we were doing load stress testing using Grindr uh, and crashing at 1,000 concurrent users um, because we killed the LDAP server. Uh, it was good to find out what the bug was. The, the OpenStack part itself was fine, but we were creating and destroying users at a rate that LDAP couldn't support. Um, so these, I mean, this was the first week. If you're going to do it, you should start out doing it. OK, we talk about community. I want to just back up and kind of prove some of the things I said before, or at least make an argument for them. Um, nobody likes to feel like an outsider. right? This is very true in, in our uh, peer group, geeks or people that write software for a living. Um, and so we seek to join communities where we feel like we belong. What that means is your community gradually looks more and more like your original team. And those folks came together around the culture that you have. So uh, it's always going to end up looking like an extension of, of your culture. We started out, again, uh, with drinking and rough consensus and unit tests. And we've ended up with a culture that includes our own uh, music videos, some band that only makes songs about OpenStack. Uh, they made up a dance, which now people in Korea have learned how to do. Uh, so like your culture persists in these very disturbing ways. Um, yeah, we'll come back to that in a minute. OK, code. Uh, I feel obliged, again, Sylvain warned me that everyone was expecting more technical content. And I know I'm the last speaker of the day, so I kind of get a pass for that. But I did feel like I needed a couple of super technical diagrams. So again, this is our first release. Uh, we've never had committers in OpenStack. Uh, the only merges to trunk are done by a bot. And nobody's code gets merged without two positive code reviews by members of core teams. If you're going to do code reviews and you actually care, you have to enforce them. Because somebody will cheat otherwise at some point. And if you have one or two people left in the community who have commit privileges, but you claim to have kind of a meritocracy other than that, you don't have a meritocracy. I don't even like the term meritocracy, frankly. But if you care about it, it's got to apply to everybody. No exceptions. No PEP8 violation exceptions either. 
Um, so this is my one obligatory technical diagram. This is OpenStack. Uh, yeah, whatever. Bunch of components, a message bus. Basically, everything everyone said about scale today of how do you build something that's going to scale in a distributed system to an arbitrary number of servers, that was kind of what we were trying to do. We're not perfect, but, but we've done it wrong a lot of times. It, it's a plug-in architecture. It's loosely coupled. It's all REST APIs. It's all, uh, you guys know this stuff at this point, right? You've had, what, nine hours of it. Um, so here's the sew up. I started out by saying that everybody lies, and this was story, sort of a story about, about lying. So let's, let's come back to the truth. There's these lies about open source, that it's about volunteerism, uh, that open source magically leads to better code, that open source projects are more cutting edge, or that they use better tools, um, and that it automatically leads to burnout and bitterness, which I think was the closing talk from, from the last conference. And I think we have a model for a new kind of open source community. Not that nobody's burning out. Um, I'd like to introduce this term chaotic, which I think is ridiculous. It's supposed to be half chaos, half order. But I was looking for a word that described what we'd ended up with in, in OpenStack. And this is the, the closest that I could come to. Um, the governance of OpenStack exactly mirrors our code. You know, we've got this end tier architecture where we sort of have the presentation layer, and we have the business logic layer, we have the data store layer. We have a three-tier governance structure with this technical committee and of a board and a user committee. And they sort of look roughly like our code base. We've got this message queue-based RPC mechanism, and we've got these IRC-based teams, uh, where also it's mostly mailing lists. So it's somewhat synchronous, somewhat asynchronous, depending on how important it is, uh, very distributed. Uh, we have open source, and we have open meetings. We use plugins, and we have this vendor ecosystem where everyone writes their own plugins and sort of builds commercial opportunities around OpenStack. Um, and I think keeping the code and the governance and the community and the culture as true to each other as possible makes it easier to scale up. Because folks that are dealing with the code kind of understand what's going on with the governance because they feel like it sort of matches. And it, it allows you to deal with just the piece you care about. Mostly. Not always. It's not perfect. Um, so there's some advantages. This does scale. Uh, we've hit 10,000. How many of you are, are members of the OpenStack Foundation, either individual members or corporate members? OK, I actually know it's more than that, because some of you, I don't think, realize your company is a corporate member. There's <laughs> 185, 190 companies as members of the foundation now. So uh, yeah, there's at least a couple Red Hat employees in here. Uh, it is resilient and adaptable. On the resilient side, this is a bizarre effect. There seems like about half of the OpenStack community uh, quits their job every six months. And they go work for somebody else. And nothing changes. They're still working on the same code base. They still have the same role in the community. They still uh, you know, go to the same events. They still drink the same kind of beer. It's just somebody else's name on, is on their paycheck. Uh, that's powerful, and we've seen that in other open source communities, but I think it's especially powerful in the way that the OpenStack businesses can interact with, with the foundation and the ecosystem. Um, and OpenStack is super general purpose. People use it for everything. Uh, and it turns out the foundation model is very general purpose as well. The Python Software Foundation just went through a big vote to restructure how they're organized. And some of the argument on the mailing list was, we want to be more like OpenStack. It looks like it works. I think they're a little wrong. It shouldn't be copied exactly. But um, there are problems. Natural systems, this idea of chaotic sort of mix of chaos and, and order come mostly out of, out of natural systems. And in a natural system, you've got bacteria and fungi that chew up the garbage left on the floor. Nobody chews up the garbage left in the code. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to SourceForge recently. But <laughs> that, was, that was mean. Mean but fair. Um, so, you know, we don't like cruft. We don't like abandonware. I, uh, I was called out in the press at one point for being the guy who approved the patch that removed Hyper-V support the first time. It came back. But taking the code out was the only way to get Microsoft to actually commit to maintaining it. When you have this very dynamic system where folks can just write stuff and contribute stuff, uh, they're not necessarily attached forever to that code and to, you know, being committed to maintaining it 
the expectation is, well, there's 10,000 people. Somebody else will deal with it, which doesn't necessarily apply. Um, it is super general purpose, which means very few people actually run OpenStack. Most folks run an OpenStack distro or an OpenStack product of one kind or another. Uh, people don't cook with Swiss Army knives. Right? And it's still incredibly hard to tell what's going on. Uh, the press uh, specifically have a very hard time dealing with OpenStack because they don't know who to talk to. They call board members or technical committee members or people they meet in the street who are wearing OpenStack t-shirts. <laughs> and then they print whatever they say, and then you have things like, oh, VMware lost $2 billion in one day in market cap based on something that one of the directors of the OpenStack Foundation said turned out not to be entirely true. <laughs> so the market cap went back up later on. I don't know how many of you sh shorted it or went long on it in that, in that transaction, but good on you. Um, so, and, and you know, you end up with all of these, you can have competing projects inside OpenStack, which is kind of like natural systems. You've got competition as things are little and then they die out. Uh, the first OpenStack summit, I tried to convince KVM and Zen to merge. It did not go well. Uh, but I think OpenStack would be better if they did. <laughs> okay, um, the last thing I wanna emphasize in, in this idea of culture is uh, this is not just about OpenStack. Uh, you can take these ideas that your culture leads to your community, your community leads to your code, uh, and you can apply this idea of being authentic uh, to whatever you do, whether it's a small open source project, whether it's starting a company, whether it's doing whatever. Uh, this is my co-founders at, at Piston. Um, we started this whole company branding thing around bow ties and, and fancy dress and steampunk because I like bow ties and steampunk. And uh, we were dressing up on Fridays because we thought it was cool, because otherwise we're like, yo, you have a casual Friday in a tech company, nobody wears pants. <laughs> so we decided to go the other way. Um, and and that, that's our company culture, and it's just been a lot easier to be public about it. You know? Otherwise you have like, you're lying about who you are to try and pretend you're something you're not. Oh, we're gonna compete with Google, so we've gotta be you know, like a big company. We'll pretend we're huge. Don't do that. It doesn't work. It makes everybody inside your company feel fake. This is true for OpenStack as well. OpenStack has always been a community about drinking. <laughs> it's so much more powerful if we're just honest. Everybody wants to be part of OpenStack. There's a lot of booze involved. <laughs> OK, um, if you're going to apply this elsewhere, authenticity scales. You don't have to remember what lies you told. Uh, names matter. This is just a side note. But nobody would pay $50,000 a year for the right to call their project Powered by Panay. So that was, I mean, Rackspace brought a lot of code, they brought a lot of marketing, they brought a lot of dollars, and they brought a good name. NASA people are not good at naming things. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, so known as Crash Test Dummy. Um, always be leveling the playing field. You know, if you wanna have a community that feels like it's a, you know, friendly to emo kids kind of thing, uh, look for the balance between developers and users. I harp on this all the time, but almost every open source community in the world is like, well, if you're not committing code, you don't count. One of the things OpenStack did very uniquely is say, hey, you don't have to commit code to be a member of the community. You could just be the person who uses the product and tells us what it needs to do. I mean, that'd be cool. Um, you know, it's, it's handy when you're building something that you want to use, uh, but you know, to have an interesting OpenStack cloud takes like $50,000 worth of hardware, kind of minimum. How many of you have like $50,000 worth of hardware in your closet? Yeah. So you're not necessarily gonna stand up OpenStack at home and, and kick it around, but you could use somebody else's cloud and provide feedback, right? If you're gonna do something, start out doing it. And, and finally, like, you just, you have to ship. Don't talk about shipping. That's not interesting. It's like talking about your job to a girl. Don't do that either. Okay, finally, lying doesn't scale. And I, I'm, uh, I'm happy to take some questions. <laughs>